Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile with a message for everyone paying big wireless way too much. Please, for the love of everything good in this world, stop. With Mint, you can get premium wireless for just $15 a month. Of course, if you enjoy overpaying, no judgments, but that's weird. Okay, one judgment. Anyway, give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. Upfront payment of $45 for three months required. New subscribers only. Renew for 12 months to lock in savings. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See mintmobile.com. Listening to your favorite podcast? That's smart. Earning your degree online from Southern New Hampshire University? That's really smart. With 24-7 access to coursework, no set class times, and dedicated student support, you can go to school when and where it works for you. Low online tuition means you can even do it for less. And dedicated student support means we'll be with you from day one to graduation and beyond. Join a community of learners just like you. Go to snhu.edu today to start your free application. Hey guys, it's Mishi. I wanted to thank all of you who made Israel Palooza, our day-long online celebration of Israel's Independence Day, such a special event. As you can imagine, it was a total experiment for us. I mean, a 12-hour-long live Zoom broadcast with 14 different events was something so far removed from anything we've ever done before that we honestly didn't know what to expect. But thanks to all of you, Israel Palooza was a big hit. Thousands and thousands of people around the world tuned in to celebrate Israel's 72nd Independence Day. Together we heard intimate interviews with violinist Yitzhak Perlman, architect Moshe Safti, Nobel laureate Dan Schechtman, cookbook author Joe Nathan, Checkpoint CEO Gil Schweid, COVID-19 nurse Rachel Gemara, video blogger Nas Daily, news anchorwoman Lucy Arish, and NBA all-star Amari Stoudemire. We sang along with David Broza, Shanan Street, and Kosha Dills. We cooked together with Chef Nir Mesika, and we even created self-portraits with artist Hanoch Piven. And all of that was thanks to the generosity of our sponsors. The Eye Center, the Marlene Meyerson JCC Manhattan, and Tablet Magazine. Alongside the New Israel Fund, Harvard Hillel, the United Jewish Federation of Tidewater, Ivy Prep, Congregation Bet Shalom in New Jersey, and Town and Village Synagogue and Central Synagogue, both in New York City. Thanks also to the gods of streaming for smiling at us, and to Megan Whitman, Jeff Fontaine, Matt Temkin, and Sam Bronswick for all their tremendous help. It was particularly meaningful to us to experience and share all these diverse slices of Israeli society now, at a time in which we all desperately crave a sense of community. In case you missed part of Israel Palooza, or want to re-watch a certain segment again, We've got you covered. Starting next week, we're going to begin posting the videos of the individual interviews on our private Facebook group. It's super easy to join. Just search for Israel Story Community on Facebook and ask to become a member. It's free, it's easy, and most of all, it's a fun way of connecting with both the producers of the show and fellow listeners around the world. Besides seeing the Israel Palooza videos... Members of our closed group can also participate in our wonderful Facebook Live events. This is an ongoing series that we began at the start of the pandemic, in which we talk to some of the most memorable people whose stories have appeared on our show over the years. We hear updates of what happened since the story aired, and listeners can ask questions. And this week, on Sunday, May 10th, 2020, at 8 p.m. Israel time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. In honor of Mother's Day, we'll be hosting my one and only sister, Dana Harmon. As many of you will recall, two years ago, in an episode called Whither Thou Goest, Dana told a gorgeous and brave tale of motherhood. The story of how she semi-adopted two Nepali street girls in the aftermath of the 2015 earthquake. What's happened since? Are they still in touch? And can you half-parent from halfway around the world? Join us on Sunday, May 10th, 2020, to find out and ask Dana anything you want. And in the meantime, here's Dana's original piece from 2018. Tying a Knot One day I walking around the dance class 
and I meet Indana and walking around. Okay, so first we met, right? Yeah. At the dance place. What did you say? Hi. What did I say? You say hi. <laughs> that time is your last day in Nepal. And then I went home to Israel. Yeah. That's my favorite 14-year-old in the world, Monisa. Monisa Guru. We met in Nepal three years ago, outside a Zumba class in a Kathmandu slum. And if that sounds random, well, a lot of things about the story I'm about to tell are. It was early April, and I'd been in the country for a month, working on a story for my newspaper. The story was done, and I was leaving for Tel Aviv early that morning. But then, my flight was delayed by six hours. And just like that, I had a whole extra morning free, and no plans at all. I decided to go for a walk and headed to my favorite place in the dusty capital, the so-called Monkey Temple, perched high up on a hill. I'd come here often before, circling the temple's base and spinning the prayer wheels. That particular morning, though, instead of huffing up the steep steps to the Buddhist shrines, I wandered off into a nearby crowded neighborhood. Around me was a hum of activity, People selling mobile phone covers and bunches of parsley, incense, prayer candles, old people brushing their teeth on the sides of the road, monkeys rummaging through the trash, and flea-ridden dogs lying around in the middle of the path. That's when I heard the salsa music. I followed the beat and discovered a crowded basement filled with sweaty Nepalis and spandex doing salsa moves. And, standing next to me, also peering in, were three little girls. Their obvious ringleader was this pint-sized kid in raggedy polka dot pants and no shoes. Her name was Monisa, she said. I had vaguely been planning on going to the other side of the monkey temple, to an outdoor swimming pool I knew there. So after a few minutes at the underground Zumba class, I made some breaststroke pantomime motions to the little girls by way of explanation, and then pressed my hands together in prayer. That was goodbye. Namaste. But the girls followed me. They were sisters, they said, or I thought they said, as we walked away. 11-year-old Monisa, 10-year-old Obika, and 9-year-old Obika. Wait, you have the same name and your sisters, I asked? Yes, they nodded, and they laughed, and I laughed. Anyway, with Obika and Obika on either side of me reaching up to hold my hands, we walked along. The girls seemed excited, as kids with nothing to do can be when suddenly walking alongside a foreigner, a white one no less. Other children with heavy book bags on their backs, who seemed to be on their way to school, yelled out, Hey, where are you going? To which Monisa answered back, We're with her. I swam laps while the three sat upright on a nearby bench, watching me go back and forth and yelling out numbers. One lap, two, three. By ten, they had exhausted their knowledge of English. Eleven, they yelled out in Nepali. Afterwards, Monisa, Obika, and Obika walked me back to my guest house, a few windy dirt lanes away. I gave them some stuff I didn't need. Flip-flops, a water bottle, a duffel bag which had been a gift from a trekking company. Monisa asked me if I had any money to give her. Or maybe she didn't ask me for money. I'm not sure. I half pretended I didn't understand. Then, when I asked her where her mom was, she said, Gone. Or maybe she didn't say that at all, but at the time I thought she did. Just as we were saying goodbye, I gave Monisa a slightly frayed business card, the last one in my wallet. It was a strange thing to do. I was living in Israel and I write for an Israeli newspaper, so my card is in Hebrew, which she obviously couldn't read. She didn't read English either. I'm not sure she actually read too well at all. But there was a phone number on the card and an email address, too. And I told Monisa that if, by chance, she and the others ever found themselves in a cyber cafe, they could ask someone to show them how to send an email, and they could get in touch if they wanted to. My new little friend thanked me and took the card away solemnly. We both felt, I think, a little sad to part. I snapped a photo of the three girls before I left. And on the flight home, I turned that photo into the screensaver on my mobile. That, too, was a strange thing to do. After all, I barely knew them. That trip to Nepal had come at the end of a tough year for me. I'd done several rounds of IVF, all of which were unsuccessful. I was feeling okay on the one hand, 
and then again deeply sad on the other. Regretful of roads I'd not taken, paralyzed when it came to choices I still felt I had to make, and worried I would always feel and be regarded as incomplete if I didn't have children. I had hoped that month in Nepal, which coincided with my 45th birthday, would be a time to get some energy back. I was craving space to come to terms with the fact that I was not going to be a biological mother. Over my actual birthday weekend, I left Kathmandu to join a yoga and meditation retreat at a monastery. Could I get more cliché? The vegan food was good, and the little monks playing soccer on the grounds were definitely cute. But my body hurt from sitting cross-legged for hours, and the old Tibetan monk teacher going on and on about the self bored me somehow. One evening, I snuck away from the meditation session and spent a pretty blissful hour surfing Facebook while hiding in the bathroom on the mobile phone I was supposed to have handed in, happily liking everyone's birthday wishes to me. A five-day trek in the rainy Annapurna mountains at the end of the Nepal trip didn't get me anywhere either. Unlike most trekkers who wax poetic about their Sherpa guides, mine drove me crazy. He had all these silly gag jokes, like he kept pretending to tumble over the side of the cliff. And he asked me if I could schlep his sleeping bag because he had no more room in his rucksack. I would say that I spent most of my hiking hours calculating how long it had been since I'd last looked at my watch. Back in Tel Aviv, after it was all over, sipping a café fouch in my neighborhood café, it was clear to me that, despite the weeks I'd been away, the loop of questions going round and round in my head about motherhood and happiness hadn't gone anywhere at all. Was it time to give up on being a mother? Exactly a week to the day after I met Monisa and her two Obika sidekicks and returned home, a 7.8 magnitude earthquake shook Nepal. This is the moment the earthquake struck. The earthquake in Nepal. After a devastating natural disaster. It was an earthquake, guys. It was an earthquake. Whole villages were wiped out. Thousands of schools and hospitals were destroyed. Millions were left homeless. And over 8,000 people were killed. And that's when she started calling. I remember the first time I saw the Nepal country code flash up on my mobile and heard this tiny, faraway voice on the other end of the line. It didn't seem real, but it was. The local phone companies had given everyone in Nepal unlimited free calls in the weeks following the earthquake, in the somewhat futile hope that if someone was buried in the rubble but didn't have any phone credit, they might yet be able to save themselves with a free call for help. Monisa took advantage and, using a neighbor's mobile one time and a relative's another, would ring me. She always seemed to want to stay on the line and chat, but we couldn't communicate much. I understood that Gorka, her family village in the countryside, had been at the epicenter of the quake and was broken, as she put it. The rented room she'd been shacked up in with her cousins in Kathmandu was also broken. I would ask her if it was raining. It always was. If school was open. It wasn't. And if she was even registered at school, unclear. Then, when we ran out of things to say, I would tell her not to be scared and that everything would be okay. I also told her that I would help, though, of course, I had no idea how I could actually do that. The daydream started hazily, drifting in and out of my head. Then they began to take on a shape and intensity of their own. Maybe it was fate, I thought to myself. Maybe I was meant to connect with Monisa and her sisters. They needed me right now. And I needed them. My imagination started running wild. What if? What if I could adopt all three and bring them back to Israel? I could turn my extra room into a kid's room, enroll them in the day school up the road where my friend Ainat sends her kids. I would take them to the same swimming class as my sister-in-law takes my niece over at the Gordon Pool. I would drive them back to my parents for Friday night dinners, and I would read them books before they went to sleep. I didn't tell anyone what was going on in my head. I was embarrassed. Of course, I knew better than to think that one can just go to a poor foreign country hit by natural disaster and simply scoop up a needy kid. I'd been a journalist for over 20 years and had traveled the world. Africa, South America, and wars in Afghanistan, Iraq. I'd seen a lot of kids in need over the years. Orphaned kids, starving kids, lost kids. Sometimes I would write an article about them, and sometimes I would snap a photo. My heart would always ache a little, or a lot, but either way, I would always say goodbye. 
But this time, something felt different. My dreams about Monisa just wouldn't go away. Nepal is far away, and there was no easy or inexpensive way for me to get back there. My editors had already sent someone else to cover the aftermath of the earthquake and had assignments for me in Israel. And I'd been planning to move to London to live with my boyfriend Josh. So there was all that, as well as the more mundane to-do list involving already paid-for Pilates classes, dinner plans, car stuff, health stuff, a life in brief. So it was not surprising that a lot of people raised their eyebrows when I announced that I was taking time off and flying back to Kathmandu. I felt the need to explain myself, which was hard to do. My mom couldn't fathom why I would want to go to a country just as all the foreigners were trying to flee and aftershocks were ongoing. That, and she could also probably sense that I'd built up unspoken expectations about Monisa. Maybe she didn't want me to get hurt. My dad pointed out that there were hundreds of thousands of children who needed help in Nepal and that NGOs and UN bodies, who supposedly know what to do in this kind of crisis, were already on the ground. What exactly did I think I was going to be able to do, he asked, gently. All this I heard, and set off. Back in battered Kathmandu, a mere two and a half weeks after I'd left it, neither the city nor the story I'd written up in my head about the girls ended up being as expected. It was like some dystopian movie where buildings and temples you know should be on this block or that corner are just gone, reduced to heaps of concrete and metal. There were bedraggled families wandering the roads, still looking for friends and relatives, trying to find shelter. The rain was pouring nonstop, and all those once sleepy dogs were howling endlessly. And the girls? The two younger ones, the suspiciously identically named Obika and Obika, were not in the capital anymore, having fled back to their ancestral villages in the countryside. And it turns out they were not sisters, just neighbors. I should have known. Monisa, though, she was right there. And she actually did have a sister, but an older one, Monica, a stranger to me. My ideas about Monisa and who she was and what I could be to her needed to be further readjusted when it turned out that not only did she have a sister, but she had parents, too. There was Dad, an ex-soldier who seemed jovial to me and who was the one who had brought the girls to the city when he came there looking for work. And Mom, a small young woman, years younger than her husband, who tended the family plot of land in Gorka and who'd given birth to Monica and Monisa when she herself was a mere child. The whole family, together with hundreds of others in the slum who'd lost their homes, were camped out in the pouring rain on a basketball court amidst the rubble of a collapsed school. Monisa seemed far more subdued when I saw her after the quake. Her eyes bloodshot from lack of sleep and her jet black shiny hair was matted. All the family's meager possessions were buried under rubble and the winds had blown away a makeshift tent they had received from an aid organization. There was no electricity, no running water, and little to eat. Traumatized by the earthquake, kids would start screaming when they felt even the slightest aftershock. Maybe I had misunderstood when Monisa told me her mother was gone. Or maybe Monisa wanted something from me, be it money or love, as much as I'd wanted something from her and so had created that misunderstanding on purpose. Whatever the case, if anything was now clear, it was that this little girl I'd been secretly daydreaming of adopting didn't need a mom. What she needed was a new tent, and maybe some rice and beans and a camping stove. Okay, I thought, I could help with that. I stayed in Kathmandu for a month that time, playing a role that fell somewhere between camp counselor, cash machine, and a one-woman non-governmental emergency aid organization. Or rather, that's probably how it looked from the outside. To me, and I want to think to Monisa and her sister too, it felt like a version of falling in love. We spent a lot of every day together having many adventures in the collapsed city and finding more and more to make us happy despite the tragedy. We climbed around the city's temples, many of them destroyed by the quake, so that the girls could light candles and make pujas or prayers for the earth to stop shaking. We stood in a long line for a new tent for them to sleep under, and then, when that one blew away too, set out to get another one. We went to a bookstore and chose some books, and, as schools began reopening, I began to push for them to find somewhere to study. 
Monisa spent days preparing for the entrance exam for one school, which she then failed miserably. I wanted to let her down gently, but Monica told her straight out that she only got seven points out of a hundred, leading to a torrent of tears. On a Skype call from London, Josh's then nine-year-old son Noah tried to cheer her up. Math is impossible, he insisted. He too was terrible at geography, he added. We looked into another school, where the headmaster ran away with our deposit. And then, finally, after some of my Nepali friends who knew what they were doing got involved, we found the right place. I bought Monisa glasses so she could see the blackboard. Soon, with their mom's blessing, the girls started staying over on the spare bed in my hostel. At night, after playing on my laptop, they would put on the free eye masks I'd gotten from Turkish Airlines and fall immediately into a deep sleep. Nothing seemed to rouse them. Not dogs barking, roosters making a racket, thunder and lightning, nothing. In the mornings, I made them brush their teeth and then would take them out, together with their mom sometimes or a friend, for breakfast. Fried bread and milky sweet tea, boiled vegetables, and a steaming plate of buffalo momos, or dumplings, which they slurped down with wildly hot sauce. Every day, we walked over to the mall to see if the movie theater on its second floor had reopened yet. When it finally did, we got tickets to see the only film playing. It was The Avengers in 3D. None of us could understand the first thing about the plot. And the girls, overexcited by the combination of their first time in the theater, the superheroes flying straight at them, and an overdose of cotton candy, fell asleep within minutes. When the local swimming pool reopened, I bought the girls a membership and tried to teach them the breaststroke. And then we whiled away many afternoons, splashing around the shallow end with a group of young Tibetan nuns in training. That's probably the most lasting image I have from that trip. Monisa, holding hands with a pint-sized girl with a shaved head, both of them wearing ill-fitted bathing suits, goggles askew, laughing so hard I worried they might drown. What's the name of your school? Kathmandu Valley High Secondary School. In Sakrapath. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. And how is that school? It's a good one? Yes. Uh, that school is so good. Big uh, ground, basketball also, swimming pool also. Yeah. <laughs> and what is your good subject? What are you good at at school? Uh, dancing. <laughs> dancing a lot. I, lo- I love dancing. I fast in dance. You're number one in dancing? No way. Yeah. Really? Yeah. What kind of dancing? Traditional dancing? Disco dancing? Traditional. Traditional. It's now three years later and my birthday again, 48 this time, and I'm back in Nepal. It's my fourth trip back here. It's not that I love being in Kathmandu so much, to be honest. It can be hard going. The potholed roads are clogged with honking cars and motorcycles all of them leaving clouds of black exhaust in their wake. It's hot, dust swirls in the air, and it's rare to see blue sky at this time of the year. Even the novelty of the monkeys who roam wild has long worn off. But there's a girl here I love, and I'm here because of her. This year I came to visit with Josh and his son, and the whole group of us went rafting down the Trishuli River, together with Susma, the girl's mother. That was a big hit. To celebrate my birthday, we drove out to Gorka, which is finally showing signs of bouncing back after the quake. We threw a makeshift party with Monisa's extended family. We actually picked them up, aunts, uncles, cousins, all 21 of them, in our minivan to get to the venue. It was like a circus trick. We spent the evening eating dalbat, or rice with beans, with our hands, as is customary, and toasting each other with homemade alcohol provided by their grandma. Monisa was in charge of the DJing. Meanwhile, at the Kathmandu Valley Boarding School, where the girls now study and live, Monica has just graduated 10th grade. She was given the Best Athlete Award in the the end-of-the-year ceremony. Monisa, after repeating year seven, is struggling along. Academics have proved a little hard for her. This year, she came in at the bottom of her class again. So Josh, the girl's mom, and I gathered together in the principal's room on parent-teacher day to discuss a plan of action. There was Susma, wearing her best dress and clutching the little handbag I'd given her, and me wearing a little string necklace with a bean lace through it that Susma had given me. All of us trying to figure out what to do. No big deal, Josh and I try and tell Monisa, who's slumped down on a stool holding back tears. I feel Susma might cry too. Look at the bright side, I suggest. 
Monisa's not bad in math. She's a star on the school's dance team, and she has sweet friends. She's eating properly at school and has gained weight since I met her. She looks pretty and healthy. Josh is all about finding a tutor to help with some private classes. Susma is worried we'll stop paying for school if Monisa can't keep up. We assure her that won't happen. It'll work out, we say. And so it will. For a while, I thought about getting Monisa and Monica to come visit me in Israel. I managed to organize passports for them. Did you have a passport? Yes, I have a passport. And when can you come visit me? Mm, after... <laughs> no idea. Me? No idea yes. either. Yeah. But then got stumped by the visa process. Yeah. yeah. We need to get a visa. Visa, yeah. Yeah. So difficult, no? Very difficult. Yeah, that's why. But I hope someday you're going to yeah. come visit me. Yes, certainly. That would be very nice. Huh? Yes, very nice. Very nice. <laughs> yeah, this is. Meantime, though, I can come visit you here. Yeah. Monisa's dad left Nepal soon after the earthquake, setting off to Malaysia to find work as a laborer. He doesn't send any money back home, which is hard and unusual. Susma left the village and moved to Kathmandu, where she found a job cutting chicken in a small market stall. She can now afford to rent a small room, which she shares with a rotating cast of relatives, and even has a little money to spare. I don't want and can't afford for Monisa's family to think of me as a bank. But the little Josh and I do send seems to go such a long way, it never fails to astonish me. We wire about $4,000 a year to the boarding school and then provide the girls with some extra cash to cover things like school uniforms and books, underwear, toothbrushes, sheets, pillows. That's it. I try to get the girls to write me letters, but they don't. Instead, they send me Facebook messages from the internet cafe or from their mom's mobile when they're back in Kathmandu during holidays. Sometimes I call the mobile phone of Doma Lama, who's the house mother at their school. Monisa and Monica, who know to expect my call, stand by. The conversations are still somewhat limited, but are improving, along with Monisa's English. If she's sick, she coughs into the phone to illustrate. If she makes a new friend, she describes her. Or if someone's mean to her, she tells me that, too. We send each other lots of air kisses, and sometimes we just stay on the line, not saying too much at all, until Doma Lama asks for her mobile back. Missing you very much, Monisa will say. Her syntax still a little wonky. I miss you too, I tell her. And I do. I could have bumped into a thousand different kids that day in the slum. One of Monisa and Monica's neighbors, a spunky little girl with a nose ring, asked me once, why them? Another kid informed me that Monisa's not special, she's not even good at school. There is no rhyme or reason to why it was Monisa. Maybe there is some fate involved, as I once thought. More probably, it's just random. Our lives and stories intertwined for a moment. And then, because that moment happened to be exactly right for each of us independently, we tied a knot. What does it feel like when we have to say goodbye? Sad, so sad. You think we're going to see each other again? Oh, uh, another year. Another year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. I hope so. Yeah, I hope so. Today is so not good. <laughs> My heart hurts a little. Yeah. You too? Yeah. Bad day. <laughs> Bad day. Dana Harmon. Julie Subrin edited that piece. Ari Jacob wrote and performed the original music. And Sela Weisblum mixed it all up. Thanks to the Charles and Lynn Schusterman Family Foundation who made that story possible. I'm Ishi Harmon, and together with the rest of the Israel Story team, Yochai Meital, Zev Levi, Yoshi Fields, Joel Shupak, Skylar Inman, Abby Adler, Alex Lisogor, Jeff Umbro, Sharon Rappaport, and Rotem Tzin. We wish all the mothers out there a happy Mother's Day. Especially you, Ima. I love you. Don't forget to join us on Sunday, May 10th, 2020, at 8 p.m. Israel time, 1 p.m. Eastern, for a Facebook Live event with Dana. Till then, Shalom Shalom, and Yalla Bye. Ima madua kaitz chalaf Lama noshri mealim Ima keitzad se sovev haolam Ech nolad
ילדים, ילדים. אמא, מדוע זה יש מלחמות? למה רבים בני אדם? אמא, מדוע שותק אלוהים ולא עוצר באדם? אמא, חבקיני חזק, ולעולם לא ניפרד. אמא, אותך אין אהבתי מכל, אמא, השיר לך הוא Inflation, student debt, recession, mortgage rates. Your employees have a lot on their minds. Offer them financial well-being support from Vanguard Well on Your Way at institutional.vanguard.com. All investing is subject to risk. Advice provided by Vanguard Advisors, Inc., a registered investment advisor.